Hey y'all, thanks for watching. Today's video is a redo from a video I did about a month ago and accidentally deleted. Shame on me. This video was inspired by uh, a friend who was getting a little hate mail for posting a picture of a, a bobcat that was killed. I think it's important that we know how to defend ourselves in a situation like that where you're starting to get a bunch of grief if you post something on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube. Most of that hate comes from people not understanding the big picture of, well, anything really, but when it comes to hunting. Today's focus is in regards to bobcats. Now, I personally feel that a bobcat is the most beautiful animal in the woods. They're alluring, um, and it's super, super important to harvest the bobcats when we can, in season, legally. We still are limited to a certain amount, how many we can take, how we can take them, and the reason we hunt predators and bobcats in this one is to lessen the stress on game animals and game birds in the spring primarily. They harass them all year round, but in the spring when we're dropping fawns and new hatches of birds, that's when it's most important. Now I know all too well that just the title of this video sets me up for a whole bunch of hate mail and that's not really my concern. I'm really just trying to take a genuine approach to teaching people how important it is that we harvest our predators. If your angle is to love all animals, no matter what, and leave them all alone and don't touch them, then you don't truly understand how everything works. The second that we build a house on top of their house, that's our fault. So by managing the amount of animals in that area so that we can live, because we are the more important species, we are doing the right thing. Now it may seem bad for that particular animal, but for that particular animal as a species in that environment with that much carrying capacity, the best thing we can do is to keep those numbers in check for the health of those animals, period. There's no argument there. There can't be. Look at it from this standpoint. If you had a 2,000 square foot home for you and your wife and your two kids and you're pretty comfortable, put six other people in there eating your food, sleeping in your bed, and you find out how healthy everybody is at the end of the day. Okay, I was getting a bit carried away there. Let's skin one. This is how I do it. If you open that cat up from his backside, split him from his vent or his butthole, right where the hairline, the tan meets the white, you want to run your knife right up that seam and just cut him on both sides right up to the foot. Then just take your hands and pull, pull, pull. What you're trying to do is separate that hide from the meat, as you can see there. It's not very difficult. This will save you from making any bad cuts with the knife. Then get to that joint and cut that joint and pull, pull, pull. I'm doing this fast because apparently I spent a bunch of time talking in the beginning. Um, if you get a tight spot where you can't quite pull it, go ahead and use your knife. But I think you're going to wind up with a little bit better product if you pull, pull, pull from the backside. So knock those two joints off the back, get any loose meat off there, cut him right up near his tail, and then pull between his backbone and his tail, and you're going to get an area where you can see just the hide left on the tail there. I use these tail strippers. This one comes from Sterling Fur. It just wraps around there, and you pull, and it skins that tail perfectly. Then I have a little tail stripper. You slide in there and open that tail up so you can make sure that you get it all open and get all the any excess tissue out of there. And then I built this great big table as a skinning table, and I mounted a winch at one side, just a cheapy Harbor Freight winch, and I wrapped that cable around the pelvis of that cat, and I clamped the legs and fur on the other side and then just push the button and retract, and that is the fastest, cleanest way to skin just about anything. Now it's not as simple as just push the button and go. 
you actually have to be really delicate because you are stretching a tremendous amount of pressure and pretty good chance you're going to have a bullet hole somewhere so you don't want to tear that hide off. When you get to the real tight places like by the abdomen, just make some little cuts. You can see right there where the uh, where that tight skin meets the fur, that's where you're putting your knife right there and just touch, touch, touch and it'll actually uh, loosen that up. Now you just continue to cut and pull, cut and pull, cut and pull. And when you get near the arm, you need to be real careful here because it gets awfully tight. So I use my fingers again and I just start to stretch and pull and stretch and pull. And what happens is you'll actually pull that arm right out of the hole. Now in this particular cat, I'm not keeping the front paws. It actually saves you a little money at the tannery by not having the feet done. So I'm just gonna cut it off at the joint and keep skinning. So the head is a place where a lot of people get confused or intimidated. Uh, the head is really, really an easy thing to skin. The ears are your first cut. So when you get in there and you can feel around for that ear, you make a big deep cut. So you're getting into that ear butt and you're not losing that ear. You wanna cut it deep. Then just pull it tight. I put my fingers in those ear holes and use them as a, uh, a little bit of leverage to pull and skin. And remember, you're just touching your knife right where that skin gets tight against the skull, the bone, the meat, whatever. Skinning is the same for all critters. You just pull it, cut the tight part. Then when you get a little bit closer, you gotta get near the eyes. You wanna make a deep enough cut where you're cutting the whole eye lid and lash and everything. I'm self-filming here, so I don't have the greatest anger for you. But you can see there that the whole lid and lash came out. A little bit deeper cut when you get around that eye socket. It'll come right off. They make great places for you to put your fingers to and pull a little bit. I try not to use the machine too much in this exact situation because I don't want to uh, damage it here. If this cat was going to get mounted, this is a real critical piece to have right. So lastly here on the face, you want to cut around those teeth, do a deep cut, make sure you get all the nose, and pull that whole bottom chin off. Voila, you're skin free. Once you got it off, I go through and take a little inspection of how I did. It's all there, every piece. Put it skin in, fur out. And then I like to take and roll it up and freeze it solid. Make sure you've got a tag to identify that it's legally taken. You don't want a salt to hide that hasn't been fleshed. So freeze it and take it to your taxidermist. Now let's do a little skull work. Now, if you've seen any of my other videos, you know I do a bunch of skull work. So here's what I'm doing. I put a little OxyClean in that pot, dumped a whole bunch of parts in there, skull, ribs, pelvis, you name it. Let it boil down, and then I power wash it. Make sure you're using the fan setting on small game animals, that big, broad fan, not the little nozzle. And then just blow off the debris. Be real careful with those bottom teeth right there. They will disappear in the mess. Once they're clean, I put them back in the peroxide. I'm doing this 50% water, 50% uh, peroxide. Bring it to a boil, wash them, inspect them. Skull work done. Okay, this is where it gets dicey. I'm trying to prove a point here. So I'm taking this particular bobcat and I'm gonna butcher it just like you do a deer, elk, antelope, mountain lion. All four quarters, back straps, and loins I'm taking out. Now, we eat lots and lots and lots of lions as Western staters, um, and it's a delicious meat. And this is just a smaller version of another cat. It's no different than if you're eating an elk and somebody else is eating a coos deer. We're still talking about a deer species, just different sizes. I do this with all game animals. I brine them. I use cold, cold, cold ice, salty water, and that will pull all the impurities and all the nasty out of them. I soak it in there for a day. I just leave it, get it prepared, and it makes for a fantastic product. You could pretty much be putting a skunk in there and it'd eat up good.
Okay, let's get to cooking this thing. I'm going to cut up one whole white onion. I'm going to get the pressure cooker ready because that's how I want to do this cat. I'm going to give it about uh, five cans of chicken broth in the bottom just so I don't lose the moisture. This is a cat that eats lots of critters and mice and lots of things that carry worms. So I want to get it to a temperature where it's cooked down very well. I'm going to grab just a house rub, put it on there. I'm going to do two hams and both back straps. See how good that meat looks at this point. It's been in that brine for 24 hours. Then I'm just going to set them both the hams and the back straps into that pressure cooker full of fluid. And I'm going to dice up a jalapeno and throw it in there with it just for a little bite. Then you just throw that lid on, lock it down, get a big fire underneath it, make sure it's steaming good, and make sure that pressure seal comes up and locks before you wait it. I'm going to put 15 pounds of steam in there for an hour and a half, which is a very long time for that much meat. However, that's how I want it. Then once it's rocking and rolling, doing its thing, check your time. I like to turn it down so it's still pressurizing. Let that seal drop, all the pressure's out, and let's see what we got. It is just crazy tender. It actually smells amazing. Let's play it a little and see how it is. Now, there's certain cultures that eat cats regularly, and uh, I've never been one that did. But after eating this cat, uh, it's delicious. I now know what I'm missing. Because I got a bunch of fresh meat, I got an idea. A little fresh jalapeno olive oil. I'm going to brown that stuff up in a pan like the Mexican boys do. I'm going to take some Wisconsin's finest Kramer smoked pepper jack. I got a bunch of uh, chips left over from a big dinner party we just had. I'm going to make some Bobcat smoked pepper jack nachos. Can't wait. I can only imagine all the inappropriate names your buddies could come up with when you served this at your Super Bowl party. Either way, it was delicious. I recommend Bobcat Nachos. Okay, here we go. So at the end of the day, there's lots of things we can do with cats. We see a lot of cats being mounted traditionally taxidermy like these two are. Uh, for years, I would help out um, my kids at school and I would bring these cats in and we'd do a discussion on the anatomy of cats and what we call a bobcat. Uh, a male mature cat is a tom. A female mature cat is considered to be a queen. Um, obviously you'll have kittens and things like that for the smaller, younger cats. But I took and utilized everything I could, as you saw. I ate the cat. I skinned it. We see things tanned traditionally where they can see how the inside of the fur is turned into a leather or you developed a cured leather, if you will. I took some of the leg bones and made a pot holder to keep your tables from burning. I took claws and rib bones and made this crazy looking critter. I took the back side of the cat, if you will, and made that deal. I took the pelvis and the scapulas, put them together for a little artsy whatever. I made father toothless time and I took a chunk of that fur put it on a couple of rows of teeth and made some different animals and at the end of the day with me eating it utilizing it everywhere I can it would have been better served to leave in the field and let the other animals consume it and utilize it that whole circle of life deal like it don't like it those are the facts thank you for watching